Uh, would you turn your Bible tonight, if you would, to uh, John 2. John chapter number 2. And verse number 1. John chapter 2 verse 1, the scripture says, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, unto him They have no wine. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Note carefully verse 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Father, bless your holy word now. Thy name I pray. Amen. The, the Gospel of John is written so that you might believe. These things are written that you might believe. And the ability to turn water into wine is miraculous ability. And that's all most people get out of this is the fact that water was turned into wine. And uh, <clears throat> truth is I've had uh, people who never darken a church door and, uh, you know, never read the Bible, never pray. But they all know where Christ turned water into wine, and they all know where it says, use a little wine for your stomach's sake, and you're often infirmities. They, they know of two places in the Bible if they know nothing else. <laughs> so, you know, you'll have them quote that to you. So you might as well expect that. But uh, there's far more going on here than simply turning water into wine. Uh, but first I want to call your attention to the fact the Bible says it is the beginning of miracles. It's the first one. John wants you to know that it is the first miracle. John numbers the miracles in the gospel, and he said the gospel is written that you might believe. The gospel of John is the fourth gospel, as you know, and it is the gospel that was written uh, after the Jewish kingdom had been rejected and the Jewish king was rejected. The Sermon on the Mount and the gospel of the kingdom now were something that had been moved into abeyance into the future because that time is yet to come, Romans chapter number 11. So the Gospel of John is a Gospel that's written to as close as you could possibly get to the Pauline epistles. It's about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. It's about believing on who He is. The burden of the Gospel of John from chapter number 1 all the way through the last chapter is to unfold to you who He is. And by doing that, it, begin, it, it lays the foundation for true salvation. You can't be born again, folks, by believing about Christ. And you'll never be born again by believing about the great ministry or the work of the church or some preacher or minister. You're born again when you receive God's salvation. And that salvation is a person. Amen. And that's a mouthful. It's a person. So in John chapter number 2, the beginning of miracles is turning water into wine. Now, when you begin to get the lesson that he teaches them here and throughout the rest of this chapter, you'll begin to understand that the wine can either be put in old bottles or new bottles. If you put new wine in old bottles, you've got a problem because the new wine will ferment, and by doing so, the old bottles will eventually give way because they're not strong enough to hold what's going on inside them. So you don't put new wine in old bottles. You put new wine in new bottles. So that's a principle that we lay down here in the text that helps us begin to understand and interpret what's going on. So what is happening here? Well, the first miracle the Lord performed is a miracle that directly bears upon Israel and upon the preaching of the gospel. 
because the preaching of the gospel is why he came. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. You see, this business of new wine and old wine has to do with a new covenant and an old covenant. It has to do with something that had been preached and something that was new. It's talking about something that, had, uh, that was being presented to them and unfolding before their very eyes and something that had been around a long time. And the principle is very simply this. As the Lord Jesus Christ began to preach the gospel, He first preached the gospel of the kingdom. They rejected Him. And then He preached the gospel of the grace of God because He preached Himself. He said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto Me. It's no longer about, uh, you know the commandments, ten of them. All these have I kept, Master, from my youth. Remember that? He said, well, go and sell what you have and give to the poor. Well, now that's not the gospel of the grace of God. And there's no way that you can carry that in and make it say that's the gospel of the grace of God, selling what you have and giving it to the poor. But you see, that bears directly on the idea of the kingdom. Because there's something about that giving and something about that uh, offerings and the sacrifice as it relates to the temple that's very relevant for the kingdom. Because when the Lord Jesus comes as the king, there will be a kingdom and there will be a temple. That temple will be rebuilt and the Lord Jesus Christ will reign from Jerusalem in that new temple of the Lord. And He'll reign as the son of David sitting on the throne of David where God promised in perpetuity that throne would have, uh, would have sovereignty, and so He will. Well, here's what's going on. There's two ways to look at this, and they both apply in, uh, in, 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 uh, in practical teaching. Number one is this. The old law, the law of the Jew, the law of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, was coming to an end. The law and the prophets were until John. But since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. That's the old wine. That old wine is not to be transferred over and put into new bottles. In plain words, our faith today, the faith of Christ, the faith of, that we have as born again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, is not Judaism reworked. It's not Judaism reworked. It's not, a, it's not an offshoot of Judaism with a Gentile flavor added to it. It's not us reaching out into the Old Testament law and carrying over parts of it that we lack and building this superstructure of the Christian faith from it. And some try to do that. And that's not it. Uh, there are those who try to go back into the Old Testament and to the Aaronic priesthood. And they carry over that priesthood into the New Testament. And they call themselves priest. And they say that they are intermediaries. And the greatest intermediary, of course, is Mary between God and men. Well, that's not so. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. The priesthood of today is not an Aaronic priesthood. It's a priesthood according to Hebrews 12, Hebrews 7 rather, a priesthood of Melchizedek. So if, if we try to carry over the Old Testament law and redo it and refurbish it and repackage it and re-spin it as a Gentile church, we're making a big mistake. And the biggest mistake we're making is the fact that we have moved away from grace and we've gone back to law. And the apostles said over there in the book of Galatians that they, in the book of Hebrews rather, that they've fallen from grace. If you try to, if you try to take the law and make it into grace, you can't do it. Law and grace are absolutely antithetical to each other. They don't work together. So the old wine in John chapter number 2, the old wine is the law. And that old wine is null and void satisfied and fulfilled in all of its demands. And it cannot save, never was able to save, never will be able to save. All it could do is condemn the individual and show them their weakness and point them to Christ. So that's the old wine. But there's also another aspect of the old wine in John chapter number 2. So what is that? That's the old man. The old man. You see the Old Testament law and typology is like the old man. So what do you mean? Well the old man is never made new. The old man is not cleaned up. He's not, uh, he's not uh, 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 prettied up. He's not spun to make him acceptable to Christianity. The truth of the matter is the old man still the old man. He'll be the old man as long as you live. Therefore, the old man cannot be put into new bottles. Just like you cannot put the, the law into a new bottle, it won't work because it will not be able to handle that newness that comes from newness of life 
that we get in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're born again tonight, you have a life that did not come to you from the law. The law did not beget you. It is not an outgrowth of the law. And the life that you have tonight, certainly, if you're a born again believer, is not an outgrowth of the old nature. God did not reform the old man. Religion wants to reform him. The world wants to reform the old man. He wants to teach you that in order to live the Christian life, that you have to reform the old man and teach him how to be a Christian. Teach him how to live the Christian life. Nothing could be further from the truth. There's nowhere in the New Testament that you ever told one time to cause the old man to live a Christian life or to teach him how to, Christian, to live a Christian life or instruct him in that. The old man's mind, his brain, that natural man, the natural brain. And some of you in here in this house tonight, you're listening to me with a natural brain, a natural mind. Because your mind is not focused on spiritual things, you're trying to process what you're receiving from me tonight with a natural brain and a natural mind. And you're trying to make sense of it, and you'll never be able to make sense of it. Your natural mind, folks, up until the day you leave this world, will be an enmity to God. It will never be subject to the law of God. It can't be. It is diametrically opposed to everything spiritual and holy. And you say, well, now, preacher, that, uh, that's a strong thing. Well, I know it is. This is why the Bible says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's a, that's a conscious warfare that you have to engage in to bring the mind, bring it down, bring it into subjection. You're not bringing it into subjection to use it. You bring it into subjection so that the mind of Christ now can begin to flourish and blossom and grow in your life. So how do I know I have the mind of Christ? Because the mind of Christ is the mind of Christ. And if you have the mind of Christ, you have the mind he thought with while he was here. You'll think on spiritual things. You'll see yourself for what you are. You'll never get mad when someone points out to you that the old nature and the old man and the old mind is enmity to God and can never be cleaned up. It'll never offend you when someone tells you, you realize, don't you, that there are two of you, a Jekyll and a Hyde. Yes, sir. There is definitely a Jekyll and a Hyde. No question about it. One is a monster, and the other one is an acceptable human being. And every one of us in here tonight must learn to know that unsaved natural mind. We've got to learn to, to know it, identify it, pick it out, point it out, see it for what it is, and immediately cast it aside, bring it down. The Bible said, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is a constant warfare that we fight. If you'll remember when, when Amalek came against the children of Israel, Amalek came against Israel and they, they sought out the weakest of the people. Those that were straggling behind, remember? They hit them from the rear. They, hit them, they didn't hit them as an army would come face on. No, it was a little bit of jab here and a little bit here and a little bit here and here and here and here. Sniping here and sniping there. And, uh, and of course, you know, there was a final confrontation. Aaron and Hur held up the arms of Moses. As long as they held up, Israel was winning. When, their arm, when his arms went down, then Amalek won. But here's what God said about Amalek. And he said about this about Amalek. He didn't say about anything else. He said, I will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. In plain words, perpetual war. Now that's a hard thing to swallow. Because a lot of people have the idea, well, I've been saved 30 years. Surely somewhere along the line I should be able to ease up on this warfare. No, there is no easing up. The fact of the matter is the warfare should get stronger as you get older because your discernment should be sharper. And you should realize that a lot of things in the past that you've accepted as of God and a godly mindset and so forth was nothing in the world more than a deception of Satan. And you realize that as you get older and you grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. So when the apostle says, I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, Identify the flesh and you'll begin to understand what Paul's talking about. The flesh is the flesh, yes. Flesh is the old nature, yes. But the flesh is also the fleshly mind. So it's a warfare. And a warfare is something that's diligent. You know the old saying was, uh, we have a war schedule. If it rains, we'll have it in the auditorium. Are you listening? <laughs> if it rains, we'll have the war in the auditorium. 
we're going to have war anyway. It's like a game. War is not a game. It's deadly serious. Satan will make you think it's a game. But once he gets you to where he wants you, he'll put it to your jugular. He'll put you to death if he can. And oh, how subtle he is at it. How subtle. And how quickly he can sneak up on someone. And so you have to be constantly diligent. Now, if you don't get anything out of the message tonight, get this, please. You all know the thing of the relationship of the law and grace. You all understand that. You know that, there's, you know that the law uh, ran its course, served its purpose. And so this new wine was the new covenant in opposition to the old covenant. Did the new covenant do away with the old covenant? No, it fulfilled the old covenant. That's what it did. But the new covenant does not have elements of the old covenant. And so when the translators got to the word diatheke, they translated it two ways. It's important to remember this. They translated diatheke, that's the Greek word, two ways. One way they translated it covenant. In another way they translated it testament. The covenant is clearly for the Jew. There is only one new covenant, folks. There are not two or three or four. There is not a new covenant for the Jew and a new covenant for the Gentile. There's just one. But there is a New Testament. That Testament is for a Gentile who was never promised a covenant to begin with. That's you. The basis and foundation of that Testament is the New Covenant. But the New Covenant right now is waiting for its full application for the Jew in Hebrews chapter number 8, this is the covenant that I will make with them in those days. The Jews are waiting for that new covenant. They're waiting for the Messiah. Little do they know that He's already come. And we Gentiles are enjoying the benefits of their covenant and we get it by a testament. A testament is in force when the death of the testator takes place. He will to us. And I've heard people on the internet and the radio make fun of that statement. I wish they'd listen to what I just said before they start him hawing and he hawing. I wish they'd give some serious thought about what I'm saying to you tonight. There is no testament until Christ died on the cross. Hebrews 9. Until he died at the cross, there was no new testament. When the New Testament talks about the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that's a general sense. But the Testament does not start till the Lord dies. Remember, the old wine did not make the new wine. The new wine did not come out of the old wine. The new wine is the fulfillment of the old wine. But the Jew at this hour, the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the sons of Esau, this, not Esau, but Elijah, the sons of Isaiah, the sons of Jeremiah, the sons of Ezekiel, these Old Testament prophets, their sons and their daughters are walking in ignorance and blindness at this very hour. Don't you think that's a shame? That's a shame. But in Hebrews 8, he said, this is the covenant that I will make with them when I take away their sin. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. They shall not teach every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. I'll ask you a question tonight. Do you believe tonight, right now, at this moment in 2014, that everybody knows him? Of course not. No less know him now than knew him a hundred years ago as far as relationship to the population of the planet. No, 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 no. So when will they know Him? When they see Him and the nail prints in His hands. And they see Him and they'll mourn for Him as one that mourneth for His only Son. But what is He going to do with us Gentiles? What's He going to do with the dogs, the goyim, that's what they call us, outside the commonwealth of Israel? No hope, lost without God. What's He going to do with us? God being a gracious, merciful, long-suffering God reached over and brought us in to the benefits of that blood covenant because it is a blood covenant. And for us, the King James translators called it a testament. 
Now the new Bibles get themselves so messed up it's not funny because they get over there in Hebrews and instead of tra translating diatheke testament in the places where the King James translated it, they translated covenant. And what they've done is take away the little nuance of difference in meaning between the New Testament and the New Covenant. And they've gotten themselves in one fine mess. How many of you believe today that God's not finished with a Jew? Do you believe there's coming a day in the future when God is going to deal directly face to face with the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But do you know, think about it for a minute. Go back with me now. And let's start thinking of the covenants in the Bible. What was the first covenant in the Bible? The first covenant. The Noahide, the Noahide covenant? The covenant with Noah? Yes. All right. Now, who's that with? I should have said with a Gentile. What's the first covenant with a Gentile? You just said it. Where's the blood? There's no blood. There's a rainbow. There's no blood. Think about it for a minute. The blood covenant is with the Jew. The first time that God brought a man into a covenant relationship with him, with himself, where blood was shed and a man walked between that blood, who was it? It was Abraham. Abraham is the father of all the faithful, including us, but Abraham is a Hebrew. And the Hebrew is the forerunner of the Jew. So the first blood covenant was made with a Hebrew. And come, then come to the New Testament. Come to the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When He said, this is the New Testament in my blood. This is the New Testament. Who did He make that with? He made it with Jews. He made it with Jews. These were Jews gathered around Him. Did it apply to us, preacher? Absolutely. Because he said, this is not the new covenant of my blood. This is the new what? Testament in my blood. But the word diatheke could have been translated covenant. There's a nuance of, of meaning and difference. It's important to understand that. And this, of course, is just one of these things in the Bible that shows you the mind of God as it begins to deal with a human being on a blood sacrifice. Do I have the benefit there tonight, of, therefore, of a blood covenant? Absolutely I do. Yes. Because I've been washed in the blood. Yes. I've been sealed yes. by the Holy Spirit of God. I am standing on the finished work, the blood covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. But in order for it to be made effective to me and not do away with them, it is a testament where He wills it to us who believe and we've received Him. So that's the old and the new. So what about the old man and the new man? The old man and the new man. What does God do for the old man? Did He ever make a covenant with him? Did the Lord ever make an agreement with the old man? Your old nature. Show me one place in the Bible where God ever made any kind of an agreement, covenant, understanding with the old man. Not one time. Instead, he says, reckon your members, reckon yourself to be dead. Crucify the flesh with the lust of the affections thereof. So it's left up to you to make a choice tonight. And that's what I'll close with. You make a conscious decision that you're going to war this war fairly as long as you're in this world. You're going to war it. <coughs> you're going to war. It's going to be a warfare. And you're not going to give your enemy any space. You're not going to give him any, any slack, and you're going, to learn his, uh, you're going to learn his weaknesses, and you're also going to learn his tactics. And you're going to come against him with the full power of the blood of Christ, the finished work, and the promises of God, and who God says you are, not who your old man says you are. Your old mind can, can dominate how you think, but you can't let it do that. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore I can do all things through Christ. I am what I am, he says, by the grace of God. Amen. That's important. Amen. I don't stand before you tonight because I'm worthy. 
If I thought I, if I got up here tonight and thought I was worthy, that's my flesh parading itself before you, and I'm all pumped up in my ego and pride. I'm not worthy. Worthy's the Lamb. Amen. But I am who He says I am, and I am what I am by the grace of God. And I belong to Him on the basis of the New Testament of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that New Testament is a blood covenant. And thanks be unto God. It's because of who He said I am. That's who I confess myself to be. And this lying devil, this lying deceiving old flesh, old flesh nature, the old mind, I'll tell it what it is and put it in its place by the grace of God and accept my walk with the Lord Jesus. The greatest tactic Satan uses against Christians is, de is depression and defeat. He wants to drive you down and keep you separated from God, beat you to death in your mind, wear you out in condemnation, constantly accusing you where you're never free and satisfied with your Lord Jesus and walking in fellowship with Him until He builds up some sense of false humility inside you where you've, you, you've given in to the old man and create some kind of religious system by doing that. Don't let it happen to you. Don't let it happen. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you use what I've said tonight for the glory of God. In the holy name I pray, for Jesus' sake I ask it. And amen.